Well, good morning, Union Church. Good morning. Like Pastor Kyle said, my name is Drake Ryder. I'm a pastoral resident here, and it's my privilege to be able to open the Word of God with you this morning. We've been going through the book of Acts together as a church this summer, and so I'm just going to pick up right where we left off last week. But before I do, I want to warn you that you're going to hear two Gospels today. Here at Union Church, we celebrate the good news of Jesus. But once you walk out those doors, or maybe even in this building, you'll encounter another gospel, an American gospel. You'll hear the news that you can pursue anything you want in life, that you can be whoever you want to be, and that no one can tell you otherwise. We live in this age of individualism where the pursuit of self is the highest good. We tend to celebrate those who take their own unique path in life and find success in doing so. Success in the eyes of the world, it's pretty simple. We are quick to celebrate the accomplishments of the wealthy and the powerful. In this book, Garden City, the author John Mark Comer, he gave this statistic. I'm just going to read this quote. Since 1950, the per capita income of Americans has tripled. The average size of the American home has gone up by almost 1,000 square feet. But the average size of the family has been cut in half from about four to two children. So let me state this trend another way. In America, we make more money than ever. Our houses are bigger than ever. But there's fewer mouths to feed. So where is all this money going? I think we can see the standard of living constantly increase generation after generation, and we long to have more than what our parents did, achieve more success than the previous generation. And because of this ever-growing expectation, we naturally pursue this American dream. I just want to give you a few examples of how this kind of plays out in our daily mindset and we might not even realize it. No one has to convince us that a three-day work week is more envious than six days of hard labor in your trade. But why? The craving of leisure is in the air that we breathe. Think about how we celebrate the big promotion or the pay raise. But years of just faithful service that go unrecognized, don't call for celebration. It's only natural with this financial reward that we love money. Or consider your own heart posture. The more influence that you have at work, the more confidence you feel when you walk into the hospital or the school that you work at. We long for the day that our voice would carry in the room, that people would respect what we say. We want to be heard. We want others to bend the knee to our needs. In working class America, we are wired to crave influence. But in our culture, something isn't working. Because for some reason, we find ourselves in the most anxious and depressed generation in human history. The pursuit of comfort, money, and power, it's not satisfying us. Our soul longs for the satisfaction that's meant to be found outside of ourselves, not within. Maybe it's time that we see our culture's lies for what they really are. Maybe it's time that we find a new way of life. We're going to look at an example of how the early Christ followers were required to turn from these lies. I mean, if you can believe it, they were struggling with some of the same sins that we were 2,000 years ago. So this story in Acts, this book that we're reading, it's a historical account of how the church got started. In chapter 8, we find out that the first church plant was actually involuntary. It was not planned. It all began with persecution. We'll see that as believers are running from the religious leaders to a new city, They bring the news of Jesus' resurrection with them. It leads to new conversions, baptisms, 
the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and also a call for repentance. There's quite a bit in this chapter, um, but I just have three implications that I want to focus on this morning. The scripture teaches us that repentance demands we give up control of comfort, money, and power in order to follow Jesus. I'll repeat that one more time. The main point that I want to draw from our passage is that repentance demands we give up control of money, comfort, and power in order to follow Jesus. So first, Jesus' followers are called to give up the control of comfort. In the story, Stephen has just been stoned to death for his faith. I just want to pick up here in chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Do these places sound familiar at all? It's actually a direct callback to the last words that Jesus gave his disciples before his ascension. It's from Acts chapter 1. Jesus said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I'm willing to bet that the disciples remembered this line pretty well. But they did not expect it to happen in this way. I mean, just imagine that your mentor of three years, who you've left everything to follow, is brutally killed, shamefully in public. And then he reappears, and he's teaching you about this way of the kingdom for over a month. And then he floats up into heaven, declaring that you're going to tell about him in every region of the globe. I would expect something dramatic is going to happen next. Maybe a big culture shift. Maybe that oppressive Roman government will finally be crushed and overthrown. Even on Jesus' last day, the disciples are expecting this big change. They say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Can you hear the desperation in their voice? But instead of a government takeover, their friend Stephen is killed. You see, sometimes the Lord's plan makes it feel like life is not going according to plan. It sometimes takes death and hardship to achieve God's ultimate purpose. It's like a piece of coal when under strain and pressure, only then will that lump of coal be made into a beautiful diamond. God ordains not only the ends, but also the means to all of his plans. If it wasn't for the death of Stephen, the church wouldn't have reached the ends of the earth. I just want to pick up in verse 2. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. The same God that declared his disciples would represent him in Samaria, now he is sending them there running for their lives. If you're familiar with the Bible, you probably have heard this idea that the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't get along. But there was a deep-seated racial prejudice between them, a hatred even. I mean, the Jews would pray. They'd say, God, do not hear the prayers of the Samaritans. So I'm willing to bet that these Jewish Christians had no intent of volunteering to go be missionaries in Samaria. So God sent them there, running for their lives. But put yourself in their shoes. What would you do if you narrowly escaped imprisonment for your faith? Let's see what the first believers did. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. 
Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Guys, this makes no sense. After running from their oppressors, these Christ followers, they can't help but speak of Jesus. It's almost as if they have a new kind of power. Because in the past, when we saw Jesus arrested, the people that were following him, they scattered, they hid, they denied him. Now, empowered with the Holy Spirit, these followers are persecuted and preaching. R.C. Sproul points out in this passage, the early church spread the faith not through the professional clergy, but through the laity. All the people took the gospel to the outer regions of the empire. So that's people like us, like you and me. Not Pastor Ethan, not Pastor Kyle, but people like you and me when attacked, choosing to keep speaking of the risen Jesus. Oh, that Union Church would just have a small taste of the boldness that these early disciples had. Because to follow Jesus is to give up some comfort in order to witness to the lost. True disciples of Jesus can't help but speak of the gospel. The Holy Spirit inside them compels them to. So remember, I just want to focus on comfort, money, and power. So my second point from the text is that Jesus' followers are called to give up the control of money. We see a few key characters in this next section of verses 9 through 24. It starts with this entertainer, and he's captivated a big audience and a big following, and they're puffing him up. He thinks he's powerful and great. That's Simon. Then there's this believer, Philip, and he's working miracles, preaching, baptizing, Simon and many others in the city. And then finally, along comes the great Peter and John, and they come in like Navy SEAL Team 6 to finish the job and give the Holy Spirit. Through these characters, we see how God's church was forming and profound, but also in some messy ways too. It's a story of a man who claimed to believe, and then next thing you know, he's being called wicked. I think stories like these are kind of refreshing, because isn't the Bible just such an honest book? There's no cover-up here. They're not trying to make it look better than it is. Um, The early church was clearly far from perfect. We see cracks in the institution that we continue to see today in the 21st century. Isn't it reassuring to know we're not alone when it comes to ministry being messy? Okay, let's focus on Simon. He's a man who seemed to have a miraculous testimony. He's the kind of guy that you'd ask to speak at your men's or your women's retreat for the weekend. Maybe get him to the local youth camp to share this crazy death-to-life story. Because he's gaining all these followers. He's getting a big crowd. And then he leaves it behind. And he actually becomes a follower. The passage tells us that Simon believed and was baptized. But then we discover that a part of Simon's motives were deeply mistaken. You see, money is not the currency of the kingdom. I'll say that again. Money is not the currency of the kingdom. Let's read verse 18. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. 
Here we see someone whose heart is still stuck on using money for selfish gain. But don't we too sometimes place our faith in money as a, che- as a means to achieve what we long for? Because I know that I've seen this within myself. Um, I have believed the lie that if I could just accrue enough money to get a down payment on a house, maybe then, maybe then, could I finally be satisfied finding stability and security that a house represents. My exchange isn't much different than Simon's. I tell God that I want stability, and instead of trusting him, I lack contentment, and I long for a peace that only the Lord can actually provide. Jesus' followers are called to trust God for the gifts that he has given each individual uniquely. We're not called to buy gifts of the Spirit, but to trust in faith that God will give gifts in his power in his timing. Church, let us give up the control of money and place our faith in the giver of every good gift. The third observation that I want to share from our text is that Jesus' followers are called to give up the control of power. Do you see how money is intertwined with power? Simon was used to being called a powerful man. Elsewhere, the Bible tells us that from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And here we see a guy who just can't help himself, but he just, it just blurts out, it just flows right out of him that he wants to purchase this power that he's just seen. In response, Peter gives one of the harshest rebukes possible. Did you catch it? He said, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. And this is in line with eternal curses that we see throughout the Bible. To perish is the eternal death of the soul. R.C. Sproul points out that we find here a biblical euphemism. What Peter said was this, you and your money go to hell. He pronounced the worst judgment upon this sorcerer and declared him in his request to the deepest regions of hell itself. The problem was that Simon saw these miracles of Peter and John. And he struggled to let God alone get the glory. Now you have to remember, the book of Acts, this is a story. So when we read this, this isn't an instruction, it's not a command that we are to mimic the apostles' uniquely given power here. The apostles' power seen in this time had a specific purpose. Peter and John had the gift of giving the Spirit through the laying out of hands, so that their eyewitness testimony could be validated. I mean, think about it. They're going city to city. They're bringing with them the fact they saw the risen Jesus. And God gave them this power to demonstrate this is real so that the church could spread rapidly in that early time period. The power's purpose was God's glory and his alone. Church, Let's not make the mistake of seeing powerful works of God and then trying to steal some of the glory for ourselves. Because that's what repentance demands. Repentance demands that Jesus' followers give up the control of power. So enough about Simon. What about you? Is your heart right with God? Because that's what it means to follow Jesus, to have a heart in right standing with God. You see, Jesus, he told this story to his disciples about the possibilities. This is just what can happen when the word of God is heard. He compares it to this um, sower who's just planting seeds and scattering seeds. And he explained that as the garden scatters these seeds, some of it is going to get eaten by birds. And other doesn't have enough soil. And so when it springs up, the sun scorches it. 
and it dies. And then other seeds, they're choked out by the thorns. And only some of those land on good soil. Only few seeds land on good soil that produce grain. So later in Matthew 13, Jesus is explaining the parable. So he's making it clear as day. There's no hidden meaning here. He said, The seed that fell among the thorns is the one who hears the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Does this look at all like our friend Simon? I think it looks like his cares of the world, such as power, and his deceitfulness of riches, his money, is what Peter calls out as wicked and unfruitful. So my question to you is, is your heart right before God? Have the cares of the world and the desire for riches choked out the implanted word? Have you obeyed God rightly when it comes to comfort, money, and power? Because I hope that no one here would claim that they're without sin in these areas. You see, we are sinful and disobedient creatures. And one day, no matter who you are, one day you will stand before a holy and perfect God and have to give an account for everything that you've done. And we sometimes take this lightly, but let's not take it lightly this morning. There must be justice done for the wrong in the world. When you value money, comfort, and power over God, when you worship the creation rather than the creator, there is punishment in order. But there is good news. There is good news. That for the joy set before him, there is a man that endured the cross. This man gave up the comforts of heaven to take on flesh. This man didn't let the cares of the world choke out the word. He wasn't deceived by riches, and he didn't prove unfruitful. This man's name was Jesus. And though his whole life he never sinned, he became sin for us. This means he took upon himself every wrong that you committed. Every time that you worshipped the idols of the world, you can call it substitution, a one-for-one swap. Your shame for his glory. Your evil for the righteousness of God. He not only took on our sins, but the rightful punishment for them. He cried out on the cross, my father, my father, why have you abandoned me? And though he brutally died, this publicly shameful death, he didn't stay dead. Though he was buried in Joseph's tomb, on the third day he came alive again. So now we have a living sacrifice, one that's good for all eternity. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this is your next step. And if you're a follower of Jesus, this is your next step. Repent and surrender the new direction of your life. If you would just turn from your ways and follow the new direction of following Jesus for the rest of your life. Now, with this gospel in mind, how do we know if our heart is right before God? I just want to set up a framework for how we can think through answering that question. Because you might be sitting here this morning and thinking, am I Simon? And never realized it. How do I know that Jesus' blood covers me? That my faith is genuine? If only there was a way to guarantee 
our eternal standing. Guys, that's the Holy Spirit. It took me a long time to figure this out, so please do not miss this. When Ephesians 1 tells us, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it? Notice that language. Sealed. It's a guarantee. There is no mistaking this. If the Holy Spirit is within you, you are saved. But then you might ask, how do you know that the Holy Spirit is in you? Well, God gave us a list. He gave us a list of what it looks like when the Spirit is in a person. Have you guys heard that list from Galatians 5? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God gave us these as evidence that the Spirit is within you. Because this is given so you can testify to your own salvation. But it's also given so that others, other believers can testify as an act of encouragement. Constantly just pointing out the evidence of the Spirit in your life. Union Church, we as a body, we need to call out the fruit that we see in one another. But if you're hearing me say these things about these fruits, this love and joy and peace and the others, if you're hearing me list these and you're thinking, try harder, let me just correct you. That's not Christianity. It's not about trying harder. The promise of the Holy Spirit is that over time, he'll complete the work that he's begun in you. It's like a tree that naturally grows fruit from its branches. You will start to, over time, given enough time, you will see this fruit naturally flowing out of you by God's grace. So friends, we can have confidence. It's not confidence in ourselves, but confidence that the Spirit of God dwells in us. With this new confidence, I want to just offer up a few application points. These are ideas of how we can take what we've learned today and live it out. Give up your control of comfort. How is the Lord calling you to be uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel? This week, this week, open up your home to your neighbors. Invite them in. Make them a meal. Just love on them. Bless them. Hear their story, their worldview. Ask good questions and listen before you say anything about yourself. Or invite your coworker to lunch and let the Spirit inside you provide the words to testify how Jesus changed your life. Give up the control of money. Jesus talked about money more than almost anything else in his time on earth. To both the rich and the poor, didn't matter. Fight the temptation to make an idol out of money by practicing sacrificial giving. Trust your heavenly Father to provide for every need. I mean, what injustices in the world, what needs of the world break your heart? Research nonprofits that are fighting for those causes. Fight injustice with not just your lips, but with your wallet. Give up the control of power. In your job, demonstrate servant leadership like Jesus did. So that means not making decisions for your own benefit, but making decisions for the benefit of your coworkers. Make a decision for the benefit of your customer or for the world at large. If, like Simon, you've worked to gather a 
a crowd for yourself. You've gathered a following. And if you're honest, if you look within, you know that your ego is wrapped up in it. Know that you are not condemned. Receive the Spirit's conviction. But you are not condemned if you would just confess your sin so that your heart is right before God. Now, with the power of God in you, the same Spirit that was in the temple's holy of holies, the same Spirit that filled Jesus, live by the Spirit. Walk in step with the Spirit. And as you go and are scattered from here, turn from the control of comfort. Turn from the control of money. Turn from the control of power. Repent. Be forgiven. And follow the risen Jesus. Would you just bow your heads with me? Father, we have done things offensive against you time and time again. Lord, if we're honest, we see the selfishness, we see the wickedness, we see it in our own hearts every day. And Lord, you're the only good, the only good in this world. Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, have mercy on Union Church, for we are sinners. Thank you for taking the punishment for our sin. Don't let us take that lightly. Lead us not into temptation of idolizing these things. Help us not to idolize comfort, money, and power. Holy Spirit, would you just fill us as we go from here? We love you, Lord. Amen.